we go. Okay, this is a fun problem because now what we've got going on is we have three masses all connected. Uh, the second one uh, is sitting on a top, the top of the table. We'll even let there be friction between mass two and the tabletop. Uh, M1 and M3 are definitely different, or this would be, once again, a very boring problem. Let's let M3 be greater than M1, and, and enough that it will pull M2. Um, then in that case, these strings, of course, are perfect in the sense of uh, physics strings, physics one strings anyway, so that the system, all three masses, accelerate at the same rate. The strings don't stretch. Nor is there any friction uh, in this. This is not a classic pulley. It's just uh, something that enables this connecting row to pass over um, this place and uh, no friction. So the tension here is the same throughout the cord. The tension that pulls back on M2 is equal to the tension that pulls up on M1. But it's not the same as the tension in this rope. These could very well be made out of the same material, the same physics rope material, but because M1 and M3 are not equivalent, then um, the tensions aren't going to be equal. I'm actually going to call the tension here uh, tension 1. Okay, so We've got three masses, and that means we have three free body diagrams. For the case of M2, tension three is pulling this way, tension one is pulling that way. If there's motion counterclockwise, then the friction, the frictional force acts in the direction of T1. All right, so T3 minus T1 minus the frictional force, which in this case, uh, the table feels the weight of M2, and therefore the normal force is what the table pushes back on M2 with, and that's why mu times the normal force is such a nice model, M2G, and that'll tell us how M2 accelerates. That's our ickiest equation. Now, um, in the case of M3, our free body diagram is simply going to be the weight of M3 and this tensional force pulling back. The system is accelerating in the direction of M3's weight, and that's why it gets the uh, positive and T3 gets the negative. And that's how M3 accelerates. And likewise, but a little different, you've got M1, you've got T1 pulling in the direction of the acceleration, fighting the weight of M1. So it's T1 that gets the positive and the weight getting the negative sign and telling us how M1 accelerates. Now these are your three equations. And the three unknowns are the two different tensions and the acceleration, typically. Uh, supposedly, you're given the masses and you're given the coefficients, uh, coefficient of friction. So again, though, uh, how convenient if you simply add up all the left-hand sides, the uh, T1s will cancel one another, and likewise, the T3s so you'll really just be left with, um, well, let's see, M3 minus M1 minus mu M2 all over the sum of the masses. I did the algebra in my head, and if you did these problems as often as I do, um, you too would get really uh, pretty good at algebra. So that should be your solution. And again, you can check the limiting cases. If there were no friction, there would be no this term. And uh, let's see, I don't know. If M3 were huge, then uh, and M1 were pretty insignificant, then 
this uh, whole system would pretty much move um, at a rate of G if M3 were significantly bigger than both M1 and M2. And likewise, if M3 were teeny tiny and M1 were bigger, then actually, if M1 were bigger than M3, we'd get a negative acceleration. And that would just mean that our assumption that the system moved this way was incorrect. It actually moves clockwise. We assumed it moved counterclockwise, and that set up all the signs, SIGNs, the way it did. But if when we plug in values, we get a negative acceleration, then we will still have the same value, but the uh, system would, in fact, move the other way. Thank you.